I'm very pleased to be speaking about two subjects that I'm very passionate about. One of them is anarchy and freedom, and the other one is Irish history. So as Alfredo said, I studied law, um, but the type of law that I want to focus on is a legal system that existed before the English legal system even was known about. It existed before the French legal system. It existed before the Roman legal system. It was in Ireland for thousands of years. As long as our history has a record, we have this legal system. Today, uh, legal scholars and historians are starting to look back to this system as an example of an anarchic society. And Murray Rothbard, who I know many people in this room are fans of, speaks about uh, ancient Irish anarchy in his book For a New Liberty. He speaks about it as the example of a historical society that did not have a state, did not have any way that um, somebody could impose an obligation on somebody else involuntarily. So basically what I'm speaking about today is the difference between a voluntary system and an involuntary system. Can I just ask, um, wow, <laughs> who in the room at the moment would consider themselves to be a classical liberal? Just by show of hands, please. Okay. Uh, who who is, uh, would consider themselves to be classical liberal, if you had to pick? And who would consider themselves to be anarchist? Nice. <laughs> okay, that's good. Hmm? I'm okay, yeah. Everything's cool, yeah. Usually when uh, we hear the word anarchy today in modern you know, media or discourse, it's associated to the word chaos. Because people think the word anarchy is a society that has no rules. Anybody can do whatever they want. But anarchy, as I'm sure many people in this room already know, it does not mean no rules. It means no rulers. It means that nobody has an inherent right to create a rule and impose it on other people. So in Ireland we had kings, but our kings were elected from all of the eligible males within the tribe, and they could be removed like that. They had no power to make laws, they had no power to do tax. Their, their function was really a figurehead, a representative of the people. What's interesting when I come to uh, Students for Liberty talks is people, you know, once they feel a little bit uh, comfortable with me, they will ask me about the Catholics and Protestant thing in Ireland. So nationalism is a big thing in Ireland today, you know, it's um, a, a big issue. But in ancient times, there was no Ireland that we think of as one nation, one people, it didn't exist. There was actually about 140, uh, 140 private countries within Ireland, with several thousand people in each country. And it was from within these people, it was a kind of um, an economic hub. Within this... Uh, economic hub, this, they were called Tua, the, the word for this was a Tua. Uh, it's a bit like a tribe, but not necessarily like a tribe. Um, the best way to describe it, it's the closest idea of what we think of as a state, but it was an economic hub with three men who associated together through contract. There's a principle of law that says, and it's a logical fact, that no man can be obliged to do something unless he has agreed to do it. So my question I always ask the people, at what point did the obligation to follow the rules and statutes of the state begin? When did you agree to this? Okay, just keep this in your mind. In ancient Ireland we had no police force, we had no prisons, the judge could not enforce his judgment. He had no power of enforcement. With a system like this, you're probably thinking, well, how was it not chaos? And it wasn't chaos because we had a very principled and well-established and developed law system. The law system was based on what I've just talked about. It was based on agreement. So in a free market of ideas, which is what we had in Ireland, we had a free market, over time, as people do business with each other, customs begin to develop. You do business in a certain way. And if you do, um, if this custom persists for, for a long enough time, it becomes a law, it becomes perceived to be a law. So they had a saying in Ireland that the laws were as old as the rocks, they believed. 
It was something that was inherent, it was a part of the nature. So today, the law is something to be afraid of. Don't be on the wrong side of the law. Stay away from the law, hide from the police, hide your drugs under the table, whatever. But in the ancient Irish system, you carried it with you everywhere you went. You brought it into your home, you brought it with you into the marketplace. They loved it, because it was justice in action, okay? So I'm obviously limited in time, but I can speak here. I have about 30 minutes. Uh, so what I want to do is just maybe give you a, a basic foundation of how this system might have looked, and then open up a discussion, and I'll allow you to guide the discussion of what you want to know. Okay, so maybe we can ask some questions. Um, so Brehan Law, as I said, it, it, it lasted for, it was around for thousands of years. It was a polycentric legal system, which means it, the, the, the laws were with the people at the bottom. They made the law and it went, it went up. Um, you see, there will always be a disagreement in society. My argument is that the state is not the best way to deal with these disputes. When you give an entity a monopoly on force and a monopoly on dispute resolution, then you have um, injustice, okay? So in early Ireland, how the law was maintained, there were classes of people who, we call them brehans, which is the Irish for a judge, brehuf. And their role in society was to learn the customs that had already been established by the people, okay? And their function was to settle disputes amongst neighbors. The system was compensatory. So um, when I was studying law, uh, one theorist, uh, Posner, he did the economic analysis of law, which is kind of in the Friedman school of thought, that he says, judges don't make decisions based on principles, they make decisions based on what's the best economic outcome, okay? The Brehans did this also thousands of years ago. When Posner was writing in the 70s, they thought he was radical, they thought this was brilliant, but this was how the system was done back then. There were actually, you could think of the judges as accountants, trying to rebalance and reharmonize um, a dispute within society, trying to settle things. So even murder was compensated through finance. Okay, now there's a, a discussion to be had there on that. But it's just to say that every single offence, they could see that it had an economic connection to it and it could always be compensated. They were not interested in punishing somebody. We're all human, we make mistakes, you know. They, so it wasn't about attributing blame, it was just about trying to find a solution that both people would be happy with. Um, so Ireland was invaded around um, the last latter half of the 11th century. But the Brehan law remained in Ireland until the 17th century. Even though they tried to eradicate it, they could not eradicate it. Because the idea, just, just try to imagine this, the concept that a state can make a law was completely alien. They didn't understand this, how a king or a queen or someone could come in and impose a law on somebody. If you have a people whose mindset is such that an outsider or a king cannot make that law, then they cannot be conquered. Padraig Pierce, one of our great rebels, said, you cannot conquer Ireland because the people, that spirit is indomitable, okay? Um, but yeah, so why did the law exist for 500 years during the occupation? One of, uh, in, in, in 1367, King Edward III released a piece of legislation called the Statutes of Kilkenny. And the statutes of Kilkenny were directed at the English settlers who had been living now for maybe two, three hundred years in Ireland. But they started speaking Irish. They started cutting their hair like the Irish. They started riding their horse with no saddles. Okay? And the most important thing, they stopped going to the king's court. And they started going to the Brehans. Why? Because they could obviously see that this was a much more equitable and a much more just system. There's a, a saying that these people who were English aristocracy, let's say, became ni gali non a gali fain, more Irish than the Irish themselves. And I'm only bringing this up to highlight the fact that the common law is held up as a brilliant system, but these people were turning away from the common law and going to the Breton law system. 
And I think, you see, when we talk about Ireland and the, the, the conflict, most people think of it in a religious term. But the Protestant church didn't exist for many hundreds of years while this occupation was happening. So I describe it as not a, not a clash of religion, but a clash of legal systems, a clash of legal principle. So where am I going with all of this? We can have an anarchic society so long as we have principles of resolution. In that if I go into a contract with somebody, an agreement, now I have voluntarily taken on an obligation by agreeing. Um, and that's where the obligation begins. If they break that contract, I need to have some way of resolving it. Otherwise, we have violence, we have chaos. You take my stuff, I take yours. And one of the, there was a, there was a gentleman, or a, uh, he was the Attorney General for Ireland in the 1700s, his name was uh, Sir John Davies. And he said, there is no nation of people under the sun that are better lovers of justice than the Irish, nor will they rest, or, nor will they be satisfied with the execution of the law, even if it's against themselves, because they know that if they desire it, they can rely on these principles. So more or less what he was saying is that, and, and this, this, this guy, he was instrumental in the, at the final abolishment. He brought in the, the common law in Ireland, okay? But even still, he said, these people, even if they are the defendant, they love the judgment because they could see the principle of it. Um, the interesting thing about the Browns, who were the judges, okay, so today if you commit a crime or you, be, you get brought to court, okay, there's a guy sitting in a black dress up on a stage and you don't know who this guy is, you don't get to pick who he is, he's just there, you don't know his background or anything. And so you have no free will to choose who your judge is, you don't even know if he is good or principled. In early Ireland, it was completely different. It was an open market of judges. So the best people in society who would gradually develop a reputation of being fair, of interpreting the customs the correct way, and reputation is what, you know, uh, you got more money, basically, because your status went up, okay? Um, one other thing I wanted to say, and then maybe we can open up to discussion because I'd like to see, you, you might be thinking of things, you might have questions, and that, that might be a better way to, uh, to continue on. But what's interesting about Ireland, even though we, we did have a very, um, you know, uh, decent economy back then, we were pr producing manuscripts and works of art and gold and jewellery and everything like this, we didn't have coins. Because coins are states, they're, they're connected to the state. Okay. The idea that a king can mint a piece of metal, and now that's legal tender, and the only tender that you can uh, do business in, you must pay tax in this way, that's statist, it's centralised, it's controlled. So the early Irish, I'm going to say to you now, had a form of Bitcoin. But it was, but what they used was cows. Yeah. It might sound a bit strange, but think about it. The cow wasn't, it wasn't a trade and barter system. The cow symbolized, it was the measure of value. It was called a shade. So a cow, one milk cow was called a shade, but you could have a shade of corn, you could have a shade of anything. But the fact that it wasn't the king's coin means that there was no third party in the transaction. Everybody had their wealth and it was completely private and you could just engage in contracts yourself as, as you went about your business. So, as Alfredo said when he was introducing, it was around the 9th and 10th century. It, Ireland was kind of Christianized in um, 462 AD, St. Patrick came to Ireland, and this uh, obviously altered the culture. But I also want to say the Vikings had come to Ireland, the English, the Vatican, and the law system stayed, even though these outside really powerful forces. And why did it stay? Because the people kept the law, it was polycentric. It didn't come from on high, it came from the people. So, even in this situation, which by all accounts sounds like chaos, no police, no standing army, no laws, no, uh, no state laws, no way to enforce judgments, but still, it became known as the island of saints and scholars. You know, it, it wasn't a utopia. There is no such thing as utopia, there will always be problems. But it was good enough 
that it was given this title. There's, a, there's an interesting book uh, called How the Irish Saved Civilization, because we were never conquered by Rome. This is interesting. I mean, they got as far as the United Kingdom, but they just, I don't know why, they just left Ireland alone. So while the rest of Europe was being um, turned into like Roman civil law, which is the basis for what we have today, Ireland was just kind of cultivating its own culture that whole time. So then when the Roman Empire collapsed in the 9th and 10th century, Irish missionaries and educators and so on left Ireland and went to Europe. It's a great book. You can find out all about it. And it's because of these unique uh, characteristics that this was able to happen. Do I think that it's possible for um, this, society, this system to happen today? I think it is possible, but not to go back. We don't go back and start using cows to do uh, trades with each other. But what we can do is we can identify principles. And because it's a historical example, we can say to the people who would oppose these, yes, it has been tried. So on that note, I'd like to maybe open it up to the floor. And if anybody has questions or would like to d direct the discussion a certain way, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, just the Icelandic system, which was very, very similar to the Irish system, but also the Native American system of law, the Aboriginal system of law. In fact, every legal system prior to the existence of colonialism and centralization are almost identical maybe culturally different, but almost identical. So I, I make an argument that this is spontaneous, that is spontaneous order. That's what, that's what human beings do when they are left alone to organize themselves. And the similarities would be that um, in the Icelandic system, I think they had cantrons, I think it was called, um, which were like districts, it's very similar to the Irish Tua. And each one of these districts was its own private sovereign state with its own internal economy. And the kings or the, the people who were elected to the top could not make rules and so on. So, I mean, it, it, more or less what I have been talking about you would find in the Icelandic system and all the other systems of the world. I make an argument that this is proof that this is how we should organize ourselves. And where we went wrong as a species we took a wrong turn along the way, which was centralization. Uh, the idea that one size fits all, that there should be a monopoly of force, and that's the only way to have a peaceful society. You know, that's, uh, to me, is a contradiction. Yeah. Um, so, you're, you're talking a lot about um, centralization, um, and that's a problem, um, because it can be corrupt. It can be corrupt. Um, decentralization, I think, is, is the future. And um, I think that um, Ireland got it right a long time ago, but um, without the right systems in place, um, they weren't able to protect it. Okay. And, 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 and so I'm, I'm wondering what your vision is for the future and, and what role do you see technology playing in that future? Okay. Well, first of all, you're, you are making a very good point here. Um, the question really, there's two parts to this question. The first one is defense. The reason why Ireland was able to be colonized is because we never had that national army. We never had somebody who could get the whole island together and go and fight. So each one of these small 140 private countries were very easy to pick off, okay? But I'm saying, um, is this society possible today? I think we're already moving towards this society. Bitcoin is decentralized currency. You have decentralized networks on the internet. Technology is, is bringing us forward to a point where government will be redundant. If we can develop systems and networks that allow us to provide the services of government or the function of government uh, between ourselves, but then it, I see government kind of as like an old dusty book. It's just becoming less and less relevant, okay? Now, we were talking last night about this. Uh, take, take eBay for example actually, okay? The eBay is this marketplace and why do you do business on eBay? Because somebody has 97% of a rating. So in Ireland, status, 
was not something uh, like titles were meaningless okay if someone said oh you're now the duke or the lord or the earl or whatever it was meaningless the only thing that mattered was your reputation so we already see in the internet and in ebay we see that we already do business based on reputation and um, so if we could have some sort of like a decentralized you know on the blockchain idea where you know where reputation could be recorded Okay, so then I will know who to do business with and who not to do business with. Now you have a, a, like a living incentive to be just. You have a living incentive to be a good businessman, to honor your contracts. Okay, so this is the idea that the law was carried with the people. It was, in, it was internal to them because it actually directly affected their lives rather than something to be hidden from. And so, yeah, I mean, I think we are moving this way in the decentralized technology world um, and yeah I think it's only a question of time with the justifications I mean we have got the historical <coughs> justifications this is what we I think this is what we want deep down um, but it's hard to justify it because as we're all like kind of christened into statism and it's hard to uh, have an opinion that isn't affected by the fact that we grew up in statist societies so this is why, for me, I'm very passionate about this subject. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm launching courses to teach people about it, uh, but the, I have an ulterior motive. It's not just to teach people about history. I want, in Ireland especially, who I would be speaking to, I want these people to feel in their heart a beat of freedom, to know that their ancestors lived this way for thousands of years, and they owe it to their ancestors to live this way again, and that could be done. Okay, thank you. Um, what's interesting about Ireland is even though we have like the Native American legal system and all these legal systems, the Irish people love to write. It was, uh, that was influenced by Christianity, so we have like so many manuscripts. Even though our country was occupied for 700 years, even though so many manuscripts were destroyed and, and, and monasteries burnt down, we still have among the, the largest volumes of literature in all of Europe because they just love to write. So there's different types of um, texts that come back from Ireland. We have the myth mythological texts that are prehistory that talk about you know, the, the god people and the two of the Danon and things like this. We have genealogies, which were very, very specific, going all the way back of kings, lines of kings going back to ancient times. There's a quote, actually, um, a Scottish historian called Pinkerton who did not like Ireland, you know. There's a lot of uh, bias and, um, let's say, negative propaganda that was put out by uh, British uh, academics over a period of time to justify it. But Pinkerton said that foreigners might think that it's too much for the Irish to claim that they have the oldest list of kings in Europe, but the fact that we were not conquered by Rome means that this is not a big claim. So there's the genealogies, there's the sagas, and then you have the law texts. Even though the judges could not make a law, they still had these manuscripts that were kind of for teaching people to guide them on the principles. So everything that I'm talking about here is verifiable, or has records, and you know, so this adds to it. Actually, there's an interesting case. Uh, um, apparently, Native Americans who were having a kind of, um, you know, a land dispute with the government, in the state of system, a law has to be written down. You need to be able to point to it. You need to say, this is it. It was made here, et cetera, et cetera. Because these other systems, they were oral. They passed down the law over generations. There was no written record of it. So there's cases in actually South America now of indigenous tribes who have looked to the Breton law as an example of precedent. And they say, well, this is our, this is our law, but they have it written down over here. So, hi. Okay, yeah. Uh, the, my main question is, uh, how would you defend an anarchic society uh, the best way, or what the way to do that, so, so that it's, we give it that way, and we don't come back to centralized society? Uh, okay, well, first of all, the time period that we know of, it, it, it was uh, finally stamped out in the 17th century, and how it, it wasn't like, it didn't become obsolete, and finally just go out of use. The English establishment, the, the crown, 
brought out a set of laws, they're called the penal laws. So if you were Irish, you couldn't speak <laughs> Irish. If you were a Catholic, you couldn't own property. They were just very oppressive laws, which if you think about it, the English system of law is held up as like the best. Look at these principles, fair trial, etc., etc. And they had to, after 500 years of failing to conquer Ireland, they had to resort to brutality, you know, and to eradicate the culture. So it was, it was existing up until the 17th century. How do we defend it from becoming centralised? This is the big thing. I used to often say to people that what we're doing here is not political, it's not economical, it's not legal, it's, it's a consciousness thing. And unfortunately, at the moment, the majority of society's mindset could not uh, you know, support this system. Okay? The reason why it succeeded back then was because the people, their minds and their heart, it was, it was in a such a way that you know, it just made no sense that somebody else could make a law and put it on them. In fact, uh, we have today, we've got criminal law and we have civil law in the system. But a crime, you think, oh, I've injured somebody, I've committed a crime. No, that's not what it means. That's not the legal definition of a crime. The legal de definition of a crime is you have committed an offence against society as a whole. Okay, and then society, as the state, steps in and goes, I'll take a little bit of that for me. This was completely alien. So we have a lot of these, like, kind of... Um, knots that we need to undo and change our perspective. The only way you can protect really against that system from becoming centralised is that the people don't allow it to become centralised. Um, but there is an interesting point to ask, um, how would we defend ourselves from outside force in this situation? How would we defend our, si our anarchic system from somebody else coming in? And that's, it's a difficult question to answer, but as I said at the beginning of this uh, presentation, I'm talking about the difference between voluntary and involuntary societies. So we can voluntarily come up with a way to have a national currency or a national army or this is how we will respond in an emergency situation. So long as it's voluntary, then it's free, you know? So did, does that answer your questions? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, I think it is possible, but I don't think anybody should decide what they are and put them onto people. I think they need spontaneous order needs to happen, and it has already. Does anybody in this room think it's okay to kill or to steal property? No. So, like, we do have these principles already. Um, but you're making an interesting point because the world is changing. The world is not the same as it was thousands of years ago. We are having a multicultural society, but there's a such thing as a pluralistic legal systems where you have many legal systems operating at the same time in one place. Um, take India, for example, when the, um, the English government was there, the Indian people would go to their customary law, especially for inheritance and things like this. And what's interesting, you know, property rights, freedom of contract, these principles of law that we hold really strong in society, they did not come from status systems. They existed prior to status systems. So that's... A, 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 I would say a case for spontaneous order will determine these things. I think the problem will be, you know, it is a multicultural society now and not everybody's going to agree. So to come back to this idea of the Tua, this private country, I mean, maybe that's something to start thinking about. Maybe as libertarians we could, and using the internet and the network, maybe we could kind of have these, you know, private economies where within this network, we deal in this uh, open legal system, we have our own principles, we have reputation, so, you know, the fairest people are known to be the fairest people. Yeah, I was going to say, have you seen, um, have you heard the concept of um, a polystate and anthrostates? Um, so, it's kind of back to what you were talking about, um, it's like, what can we agree on, right? And, and, and the concept of an anthrostates is that yeah, everyone is their own country, you know, Every, everyone agrees to okay. a certain amount of laws and if your laws agree with uh, another person's laws, you essentially become a, a policy. Um, I think, yeah, I see what you mean. Um, 
I mean, in principle, that was kind of happening in the sense that everybody was a sovereign. Right. I often say to Irish people, if you have an Irish surname, you're descended from royalty. Because in Ireland, everybody was royalty. If you had a piece of land, this is your house, that's your castle. If somebody came to your castle, it was your law that was laid down. Um, and there's a maxim of law, I'm not sure if I said this already, but contract makes the law. So the law is determined, there is no law. Okay, okay, I studied jurisprudence, it's just legal philosophy. And you go in and out of all these different theories, natural law, positivism, realism, and you realize there is no such thing as law. It's a, supernatural, it's a um, fictional construct. You have laws of physics, you have laws of nature, yeah, fair enough, but the laws of man are just imaginary. Okay, so, so, exactly. So the state can say, oh, I have the power to make this law because, oh, look, the Constitution doesn't, and it says Holy Trinity. In the Irish Constitution, the first line is the Holy Trinity. It's not a Constitution, it's a prayer. You know, and they're using this as a justification and people don't even question it. Um, but contract makes the law. We're animals. Okay, we can do whatever we want, really. Okay, we can fight, we can kill, we can maim, we can steal. But there's the idea that um, I will voluntarily undertake certain obligations, duties of, you know, brotherly kindness. And um, in, in the, I, I said that a crime was defined as an offence against society as a whole. In early Ireland, it was defined as a lapse in the standards of personal honour and brotherly kindness. That was what a crime was. That's a very simple way of doing it. And if you and I had a, a contract, an agreement, and you went and cheated me, no one would do business with you. You'd be yeah, known yeah. as a cheat. For, yeah, exactly. And you only have one name. Yeah. You only have one name, so. Any more? <coughs> right. Um, it's very fascinating that uh, libertarians are now doing this historical research, and it's very important. Uh, I would also perhaps like to challenge you a little bit on the kind of global anthropological record, because I think there's a cautionary tale to be told uh, if you look at like the utopian socialists and communists of the 19th century, 20th century. They were really fascinated with looking at the anthropological records and you know trying to claim that you know we can find uh, the kind of original state of communism, which proves that it's uh, that human nature okay, is, yeah. uh, can support this kind of um, communal ownership of property and so on. So I think if you look at like different societies, um, you know, at least they are not like private property utopias or anything like that. Um, overall, so I mean, it's a very complex record. So what do you, what do you say to that? Okay, and um, in my opinion, society should be so decentralized that it comes to one, it comes to the individual. Okay, um, but we're talking about concepts today, capitalism, communism, so on, that they didn't know these ideas. We are kind of forced into a dialogue where we have to view these things as opposites, but in earlier times they weren't seen as opposites. And the interesting thing about the Irish system was it was very capitalistic in the sense that you were encouraged to increase your wealth, visible wealth, so that your status was higher. But at the same time, okay, this is an interesting thing, the Tua, this, this economic hub, had a certain amount of land no, nobody was able to claim ownership of the land because it was there before they got there and it would be there after they'd gone. So they actually had redistribution of this land. Everybody who was a free man was entitled to a portion of the land to use, to put his cattle on, to grow his crops. So this is the social aspect. This is the communistic aspect. There's a safety net in society. Nobody had an excuse to be poor because you were given the basic to start off. But once you had that, then you had to increase it. So I think it's interesting, this, uh, this dichotomy of uh, socialism and capitalism, um, because it wasn't necessarily known to them. I don't know if that's fully answered your question. Yeah? OK, cool. Hi. Hi. Uh, has the, uh, the Irish uh, legal system still reflect some of the American law? <sighs> we have an English legal system in Ireland. Um, I say that the Breton law is visible in Ireland in the nature of the people. The Irish are always considered to be friendly, hospitable people, 100,000 welcomes. That's because it was actually illegal <laughs> not to be hospitable in early Ireland. So it was, if, if somebody came to your land as an outsider and knocked on your door, you had to give them some food, a, a hot, hot water and some uh, place to stay. 
And if you didn't do that, you had committed an offence of driving away somebody. Now, this is brilliant because what did it do? It allowed for a crossing over of cultures within these two as an exchange of ideas and then trade. So um, I often use the example that you see it in, in that way, that the hospitality. Also, the TUA, the whole organization, was liable for a secret crime. That means if somebody came into the area or somebody was mugged and we did not know who the, uh, what's the word, Offendant, uh, offender was, the liability to restore the, the debt fell to the whole community. What does that do? It creates this automatic community impulse that offenders should be brought to justice. If that was your cousin or something, you're going to be like, come on, you're going because I'm not paying for you. You have to go and you have to sort this out. Um, so that's an interesting point as well. Um, I, can't, well I can't remember what your question was. <laughs> Oh yeah, sorry, yeah, I know, yeah. I was going somewhere with that. In um, maybe like three years ago, there was, a, there was a football match in Dublin between Austria and Ireland, I think it was, and some Austrians had come to visit the capital city and they were doing some sightseeing and they got mugged. They were, their wallet was stolen and their tickets were stolen. And as soon as the Irish fans heard about this, they went onto Facebook and they, they got all these Irish fans to start throwing money together and they got in contact with the Football Association of Ireland to get replacement tickets and it was in the newspaper, the Austrian fans with their tickets. That's what I'm talking about. Nobody had to tell them to do that. They just took it upon themselves to go, that's wrong, they're in our community, they're an outsider, we need to make sure that they're restored to their debt, that their, their loss is restored so that they leave this country happy. So it's not in the legal system, because we have an English legal system, but it's in the nature of the people. Uh, there was a quote from a barrister, um, his name's R.W. Bentham, and he was writing in the 50s and 60s. He's an Irish barrister. And he said, the Irish irreverence for the law does not stem from sympathy with crime. So, the disrespect that the Irish, you know, the unlawfulness of the Irish is not from a sympathy with crime, but from the fact that the Irish know that the law in Ireland is not Irish law. However just, however good it might be, it is not Irish law. It does not command respect as a native institution, but they just accept it as practical, necessary for the arm of the state. So if you have a legal system that's imposed by an outside foreign force, how can you ever carry that in your heart? How can you ever, like, on principle, want to stand up and, and, and promote those ideals? Um, that's why I think it's, 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 there's a very strong case to say um, arbitration and private mediation is where I want to bring my career further down the line. And this is what I'm thinking of. I'm imagining, you know, how are we going to uh, settle disputes in an anarchic society? And I think that this, this is the way to go. Um, one other thing is, you do see an element of the old system in how the Irish uh, name their institutions. So we have, instead of parliament, we have the Dáil, which is an ancient Irish word for an assembly. We have, instead of a prime minister, we have a Taoiseach, which is the ancient Irish word for a chieftain. And we also have, um, this, the, prime, the deputy prime minister is called the Tánaiste, which comes from a very old custom where the king would be elected, but also his replacement would be elected at the same time to avoid any disputes and so on. So we do have little bits that, that crack through, but if I have anything to do about it, we'll have more soon. So is that, are we finished? One more, one more question then, please, if there is one. Okay, so these are all anarchists now. <laughs> yeah? How do you think this point with the advanced technologies and nuclear weapons and the current legal system being in place for about well, quite a lot of several centuries mm -hmm. it is to implement the principles you were talking about? Okay. I, I don't know if I fully understand your question. You're, you're asking about like nuclear weapons and things? Um, how real it is? How do you think it is real to. Like, what are the chances that implementation of these principles is possible? Okay, well... We are just talking about how it could be um, wonderful to change people's minds, and how do you see... Mm. Um, what are the chances? Yeah, I, I, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't think that this is... Even promoting these ideas and talking about it is going to be... It's not going to reach that high level 
of um, the state level. It has to begin from the ground up. But, you know, the existence of nuclear weapons, are only, they only exist because states exist, you know. Like, people often blame religion for war. Religion doesn't, doesn't fight wars. Religion gives a reason to go to war. But states are the only thing that can mobilize that sort of force and that power and put so much money into developing weapons of mass destruction and so on. Um, the United Nations, believe it or not, is an anarchic legal system. So on that high level of the United Nations, it already acts like this. I mean, it, there's, our, as a sovereign nation, uh, you have no obligation to do anything. This is why a, a state can kill its citizens. This is international law. A state is allowed to kill its citizens because the citizens are the property of the state until the state goes and signs some human rights um, treaty or something like this. They voluntarily undertake the obligation and it, within the treaty it says if you break this obligation then these are the consequences. Well that's more or less how the system worked back then. I mean, the United Nations, I think, has kind of just copied what was the natural legal system of the people. So, I mean, I don't know if I'm fully answering your question, but I think that, you know, states are to blame for these sorts of things. And um, I think only when, you know, we as a people start to live differently amongst ourselves, we don't wait for it to come. We don't wait for the si like, no politician is going to turn around and say, oh, the system is anarchist now. No. We need to demand it with our lives. One of my favorite quotes is from Albert Camus. In an unfree world, you must become so absolutely free that your very existence is an act of rebellion. So I hope you take that with you. I don't know if I fully answered your question there, but you know, um, I think it's a big, a big issue what you're asking about. Um, but I would answer it by saying that you know, states are the cause of these sorts of things. And if we had anarchist systems, Perhaps we would need to deal with it. If I could add to that, um, I think that it's happening right now. Um, I'm an example of that. Um, my, my company is building um, a blockchain-based voting system to establish consensus, a permanently verifiable record of history on the blockchain. So the technology exists, and it's, it's about the people using the technology, developing the technology and using it and implementing a foundation that you can't mess with. Um, so it's possible, and we're building it. It will be there. Sounds very optimistic. Yeah. So be patient. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Thanks. That's enough, seriously, guys. I'm Catholic, we don't do praise well. Catholics like, come on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>